like John said, um, I waved my arms around enough and got put in charge of network and telecom here at Clemson. I've been in that role for the last uh, five years. But prior to that, uh, 13, 14 years prior to that, I was a network engineer. Uh, and what a network engineer does, if you don't know, is they're responsible for configuring and operating all of the equipment that is the network. And the network does not include things like servers um, and what everybody kind of, when you think of a network, most people think, oh, it's a bunch of servers and some wires. Um, and that's not really true. So in network services, what we're responsible for is the network. And the analogy I like to use is that if computers were cars, we are responsible for the roads. We don't build cars, we don't work on cars, we're just responsible for the roads. So there are um, on this campus about 3,600 uh, network devices. That's routers, switches, um, actually, and that does not include access points, wireless access points of which there are uh, about 2,600 right now. And so um, my team is responsible for configuring and operating all of those. And today it requires a pretty significant amount of human touch to do all of that. So when you're a network engineer and you're working on network equipment um, <clears throat> and you have to think about when somebody calls you and says, I can't get to something or something is slow or something like that, how do you think about troubleshooting that? Um, and uh, what I figured out when I was a network engineer, and I think what most engineers today would tell you is, um, you have to think like a packet. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but every time you send data across a network, your computer uh, takes whatever you wanted to send and chops it up into small little bits of data called packets and transmits them across the network. And then our network equipment um, reads the addressing information on those packets and sends them on to their destination. This is a really simplistic way of doing it. So if you want to understand how a network works, you need to understand the life of a packet um, from when it starts to when it gets to its destination. And so I started doing this and I started saying that and people started referring to this talk as the life of a packet. Um, and so that's basically what we're going to talk about today is um, <clears throat> a packet. So on one end we have uh, a computer here and um, just for simplicity's sake we'll say that it's connected with an actual copper wire. People still don't know that. Um, but just to illustrate Wireless access points are actually plugged in in the same place to the same things that your computers plug into when you plug into the wall. So, just to illustrate what I have drawn up here, um, this is a computer, and maybe uh, we're going to pull up a web browser and we're going to type in google.com and, and hit enter and expect a web page to show up. Um, so, what I wanted to show you guys was what actually has to happen. Um, in order to just get that web page to show up. Um, and a lot of this was inspired, um, I guess it was about 15 years ago, I got mad and left Clemson and I went to go work for Cisco, uh, who builds the network, a lot of the network equipment that we use. And one of the things, uh, when they interviewed me, they said, Dan, tell us exactly what happens to a packet from the time it First tell us how the computer makes the packet, and then tell us exactly what happens to the packet all the way through the network, and don't leave out a single detail. And that was the interview. Um, so if you want to be a network engineer, that today is my interview for a network engineer, um, because you really have to think through that. So what I want to do is walk through it with you guys. <clears throat> so we've pulled up a web browser, and we've typed in www.google.com and, and hit enter. <clears throat> so at a high level, you might know that what your computer does is it sends out um, an HTTP hypertext transfer protocol get request. It says, get me the root uh, web page at www.google.com. So <clears throat> you know that at a high level, 
that get request has to come all the way over here to somewhere out on the internet where there is something that is running a web server that will answer that. But before it can answer it, the packet's got to get there first. Um, so let's talk about that. So we've got to get some data all the way over to google.com. And I told you that um, uh, that data is transported in these things called packets. And a packet is nothing but a blob of ones and zeros of a specific length. That's all it is. And it, we know that at the very end of that blob of data <coughs> is the command that we actually want to send to the web browser, which is the get forward slash HTTP 1.1. That's the actual text that it needs to send over to that web server for that web server to be able to send you to say, oh, they want to see my web page. I'm going to send that to them. So then how do we get it over there? <coughs> this that I've drawn right here is called the OSI model. Um, and in the early days of networking, we kind of iterated around a lot about how was it that we're going to send data across the network. Finally, we realized that we needed to have a common structure for how we would structure data that we sent across the network. So we have the OSI model. And the way this is laid out, there's seven layers here. Um, <clears throat> and starting at physical, so the physical part of the network. What is the physical part of the network? Wires, fiber, um, it, it could be, um, so this is wires, fiber, what are some other physical things that carry network data? Is this just speaking over the devices as well? No, we're just talking about the stuff we're going to send it down. Okay. So wires, fiber, there's at least one more. Which? Uh, yeah, radio frequency. <clears throat> and uh, then on top of that we have the data link layer which are things like Ethernet in the old days there was also ATM um, token and token ring and other things like that <clears throat> the network layer are protocols like the internet protocol IP also, in the old days, it used to be protocols like IPX, Apple Talk. You can see the world has become simpler in many ways. Um, <clears throat> transport. This is the protocol that's responsible for making sure that the data actually got there, and there are different protocols for doing that. An example is TCP, or the Transmission Control Protocol. Other examples are UDP, uh, all right. No, that's not a transport protocol. Um, uh, UDP, uh, uh, SC, yeah, well, we'll just get rid of that. <coughs> Session protocol. Um, an example of this would be HTTP. Presentation protocol example could be something like HTML. And an application would be an application, like the example I'm going to use here is Firefox. So the way this whole model fits together is you are using the Firefox web browser, which will render HTML, which will be transferred via the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, which will be sent over TCP port 80, which will be sent using a internet protocol address, <clears throat> which will be sent over Ethernet, which would be sent over a twisted pair copper cable, or it could be over a radio if we were using wireless. So <clears throat> given that that all fits together, guess what format data is arranged in a packet? Anybody guess? Probably the same direction. Yeah, exactly. Um, so 
<clears throat> the very first part of the packet, obviously a packet doesn't know anything about wireless cables, so that part isn't in the packet, but the very first part is the data link portion of the packet. Um, and again, this is all ones and zeros, just a bunch of ones and zeros. Um, data link portion of the packet contains the destination Ethernet address, oftentimes referred to as MAC address. The next portion of the packet contains what? Sensors. Yeah, the network portion of the packet. The destination uh, uh, IP and the source IP. And the transport part. If some parts of this don't make sense, just suspend your belief. Disbelief for a little while. It'll fit together. Um, transport part, we're going to say TCP port 80. And then, um, uh, then you have your, uh, well, and then that's actually all there is to it. I drew my packet too big. Is the uh, uh, session, which is the HTTP portion of the packet, which contains the HTML in this case. <coughs> so the computer is going to construct this thing, which just think of it as an envelope that contains this data that we wanted to send. That data could be a picture, it could be words, it could be whatever. Yeah. Are all packets the same size? No, they're not. They can be any size from a minimum of, I don't remember what, up to a maximum of normally of 1,500 bytes. Um, they can be much larger, um, but it's very, it doesn't, there were protocols like, like ATM where everything was a 53 byte packet or cell, but today Ethernet, they, they're variable length. And that's one of the things that is, actually determined in the data link. It says how long the packet's gonna be so that the devices know that they gotta listen for the next X amount of data and then send that data. <coughs> so now we have made this packet. And now, and we, we know that we wanted to send this, you know, this thing to tell the web server that we wanted a web page. We know that it's gonna happen on port 80 of TCP. How did we get our source IP address? How did we get our destination IP address? How did we get our source Ethernet address? How do we get our destination Ethernet address? The source is pretty easy. Okay. The destination I was wondering when you put that up there about the destination map. Yeah. And yeah. Like, I don't know that one. Okay. So how did how did we get the IP address of this computer right here? How did it get an IP address? Simply by physical recognition of the encoded device, right? Um, no, you had to somebody. It had to get one. It didn't come with one. So there are there are at least two ways that it could have gotten an, an address. Well, you're talking about Mac, right? Ethernet. Oh, Ethernet. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I, if you're talking about I Mac, mean, we're built in. Yeah, you're right on that. I'm talking IP. We haven't got. Okay, that. okay, okay. So IP. So IP address. How? What are some ways it could have gotten that? You could have entered one manually, right? What's the other way? DHCP could have gotten one automatically. So for simplicity's sake, let's just say that this computer had one just statically assigned. So let's say that it's uh, <clears throat> 130.127.4.22. Um, and that was my, uh, that was actually my first job in network services. I used to sit there and I'd say, network services is a Dan, and they'd say, uh, hey Dan, this is Ken over in biology. I, we just got a new computer over here. Did you? Oh, okay. Well, if you want an IP address for it, I bet. Yeah, well, here it is. And we would read it out. And believe it or not, that was from the days before there was DHCP. Um, and that was one of the best protocols that ever became invented, in my opinion. 
Um, Although they didn't trust it. For no, people didn't trust it. They were <laughs> sure that it was it was DCIP's attempt to control and change your IP address. But uh, eventually we figured out that it's a whole lot easier than calling me and going through a 10 minute conversation to get an IP address. So, um, destination IP. <coughs> Where do we get that from? That has to be search. All I did was type in www.google.com. Oh, you got it from the table. From the what um, table? D, uh, DNS. Okay. So DNS. So, uh, and, and we'll gloss over that little detail for right now too. But so your computer behind the scenes before it built this, it went and said, okay, we've got to build this packet. We've got a lot of information we've got to stick in here. <laughs> One of the things we've got to stick in is the um, is the destination IP address. Well, www.google.com is not an IP address. So how do we get that? By making a DNS query. So we make a query to the domain name system and we say, hey, what's the IP address for www.google.com? Anybody have a, can somebody tell me what the address of www.google.com is right now? I can tell you, usually it's 8.8.8.8. Sometimes it is. Um, can you just pull up a terminal, Bobby, and just say nslookup www.google.com? I'm always amazed how fast, I mean, especially with the recognition, I'll not even have my whole address typed in. It's brought up a page for me. Yeah. <laughs> if you can, I'll just make something up. But, um, uh, address is. Source MAC address, Ken, you already knew where that came from. Right, each, each device always has a... It's burned into number. the Ethernet card. So we'll just say that it's Ethernet address D. It's a 48-bit, big, long, hexadecimal thing. We'll just say that it's D. All right, destination MAC address. Now we get down to the meat of the matter. What do we put in that? Does that come from the DNS? No. Nope. Anybody have any idea? Is that the destination MAC address of this thing over here called no, Google.com? The destination com? address of the nearest router, right? Okay, that's right. But how do we know that there isn't a, uh, how do we know that Google.com isn't plugged into our same local network? I mean, you know it's not, but how do you, how does the computer know? Well, it knows its own IP address. So it knows the gateway is going to be generally ending in on dot one. What is all of the information that when you used to call me and I used to give you an IP address, I'd give you the IP address of 130.127.4.22, and the other thing I'd give you would be the one other thing. Gateway. The default gateway, which is usually dot one, but it could be anything. What's the other thing that I'd give you? Broadcast and subnet, subnet mask. Subnet mask. <clears throat> In this case, it's, that's usually what it is. Um, and the other thing I gave you was the DNS server. Um, so I gave you all that information. So given that, which one of these things is what tells the computer that www.google or that 64.233.177.105 is not on the same network as 131.274.22? Gateway. Well, okay. Yeah, the subnet mask. What that does is it tells you what portion of the IP address is describing networks and what portion of the IP address is describing hosts on that network. So what an IP address really is, is it's 32 bits of ones and zeros, right? 
So can somebody convert 130 into uh, into binary for me? But it's 128 plus 2, I guess, isn't it? So one, one if you go backwards. It'd be really cool if we could do this. I, I zero zero one. Zero start one. from the start from the yeah. right. Zero zero one. I mean, yeah, it's I'll just a bunch of zeros and ones, but I'll tell you. It's no, actually the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I know I'm sure I got it. So. <laughs> or just Google a converter real quick. I, I thought I did. So uh, I think it's it says zero one zero zero one one one. Oh no, sorry. Zero one zero. Four zeros. Okay. There's more to it than that. Oh, yeah. Zero, one, zero, and then four zeros. Is that what kind of word short? And then you got a one and a zero at the end of it, right? Yeah. It's sorry. Zero, <coughs> one, zero, one, and then four zeros. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, what's 127? Is all ones. All ones. <laughs> and a zero? And two zeros, right? And a zero. <clears throat> okay. What's four? Zero, 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 zero. It's going to end in one zero zero. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so it's zero 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 one. One and then two zero. All right, and point two. That is uh, zero one zero one zero. <laughs> Hang on. So one oh one ten. What was it now? Sorry. One oh one ten. Zero one one oh one ten. Okay. Yeah. And this one. Should be, they should be leading zeros. Okay. And four has another zero in front. Somebody read me the whole thing now. I'm slow. Zero, zero. Zero, zero. One, oh, one. One, oh, one. <laughs> okay. The third one has another zero in the leading. Okay. Well, all right. Now, here's an easy one. This sudden mask here, what is what is that converted to the binary? <clears throat> That's two fifty five is the is the is the max. So it's all ones. So in in a, in a subnet mask, if it's one that means it's a network. So you do a logical <coughs> end on this, and whatever falls through to be, um, whatever falls through to be a one is a network, and everything else is a host. So what the computer does is it takes a look at this, at the subnet mask versus the the network that it knows the computer is on, and says, is it on the same network or not? Is the short version of the story. Um, and if it's not, if it is. Then what does it do? Talk to it directly. Well, it's it's still got what what we're trying to do right now is we've got to build this destination MAC address. What do we put in there? Well, I believe the thing leading the stuff is one. All right. So um, I let's say that I determined that uh, just suspend all this for a second. I determined that. This network, this was on the same subnet, 
Um, so I would use this protocol that we have called R, address resolution protocol, and I would send out a broadcast to everybody on the network and say, hey, who has a 64.233.177.105? And somebody would answer and say, I have it, and my ethernet address is B, you know, or something like that. In this case, we know clearly that uh, the destination IP is not on this same network, so we have to put something in there. And Bobby or somebody said it earlier, what MAC address would we put in there? Yeah. <laughs> what is this? What is this thing? Gateway. Gateway. So whose MAC address do we put in? The gateway. Yeah. That guy's MAC address. So if we don't already know it, we would send out an ARP request and say, who has 131.27.4.1? And we would chunk that in there. Let's just say for this that it's, it's MAC address A. <clears throat> well, lo and behold, we have created a packet. So now we're ready to send it on the network. So this is why we don't have such <coughs> tapes of long. <laughs> we haven't even touched the network yet. This is all your computer. I go back and get all my clients. Why it's so slow? <laughs> yeah. So what goes on here now? Uh, if we go back over to our network, is we've got our computer, we've got a patch cord running from our computer to the jack on the wall, and then we have acres of cable running from that jack on the wall back to this switch, which is located in the closet somewhere down the hall. <clears throat> so we know that this is called a switch. And I will tell you that the special thing about a switch is that it, it understands the data link layer. And that's all it understands. <clears throat> so this switch uh, packet comes in here, and of course we know that ultimately it's got to make it this way. But the question is, how does that switch know? How do it know? How does it know where to send the packet? In the old days, this was a hub, and that was easy because whatever came in on one port would just get sent out on all the other ports and it would eventually get there, right? But a switch is special. Anybody know what's special about a switch? It knows what, what ports to use. How does it know? From a, usually a table, right? Bingo. It builds it that right. way. Yeah, it has a thing in it called a um, MAC address table. And in that table, it has the MAC address, And what else would it, what would be the other entry in the table? Uh, probably IP. So, remember, doesn't even know what an IP address is, never will. Oh. The port number. There you go. And how does it populate that table? Just by traffic? Yeah. So when I turn that switch on, and it's never heard a single packet before in its life, and I've turned my computer in, and this table is completely empty, how does it populate that thing? How does it know, if we said that uh, my source MAC address, that I'm actually B, MAC address B, how did it learn that MAC address B was on port seven right there, versus eight and nine there? It would ask everybody who you are. No. It's completely passive. The, uh, Your computer, computer doesn't even know that it's plugged into a switch. I'll give you a hint. The technical name for this is a learning bridge. Switch is actually a marketing term, but it's, it's technically a learning bridge, which means that it learns. So it learns by listening to traffic. It watches traffic go by and says, oh, those MAC address, I just heard MAC address B come in on port seven, so I know he's there. And I just heard MAC address A coming in on port um, nine right here, you know, for example. Um, <clears throat> or this has got to be something other, because I've already got one, port 10. Okay, but this
this table's empty right now. It hasn't heard anything. This is the first packet that's coming in. So my computer said, thank God I finally got done building that packet and I'm sending it out. And it sends it out and it gets to the switch, which happens to have an empty MAC address table. What does it do with that packet? <clears throat> it knows nothing. What would you think it would do? It has to forward it. Forward it to everybody. Exactly. Except, Except the, 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 the one it came in on. It's exactly what it does. It sends it out every single port on the switch except for port 7, which it came in on. And then it says, aha, um, MAC address B was on port 7. And it adds that to its MAC address table. And from now on, if it receives a, a packet with a destination of MAC address B, it says, oh, that's on port 7. And it just sends it to port 7. But it has to go back every now and then to recalibrate. I guess exactly. You plug and These entries expire generally every five minutes. Wow. So every five minutes, the switch will blurt everything out of every single port for any given amount of traffic. But it learns it on the very next packet that comes through. So, uh, but th that's how it works. So in this case, we're sending the MAC address B, and we have no idea that it's on port ten. Um, <clears throat> so we're just going to forward it out every single port except for port 7. How will we eventually learn that MAC address B or MAC address A is on port 10? How will it eventually learn? What's it it's not going to learn for this first packet. It's just, it's, the switch's job is like a hot potato. I got a switch, I got a packet, I have to move it, but not optional. Um, can't hold it, can't think about it, have to move it. So we're going to forward it at every port except for the one it came in on. But eventually this guy's going to answer back with a web page or something, right? And that's when it will fill in this second entry right here in the, in the table. <clears throat> so if this is a switch then, any idea what this thing right here is? Router. A router. So if a switch or a learning bridge is a layer two device or a device that understands the data link layer, what do you think a router understands? Probably the transport thing. Right? Um, well, what's our next? Network this is this is seven. layer two. This is layer three. This is data link and network. So routers think about layer three, right? They think about yeah. what IP address is where. They also they also do all these functions here, these layer two functions. But in addition, so when this packet came into this switch, that switch, really all he read was the destination MAC. I don't care what else is in that packet. All I care about is where is it going, and I gotta send it. Um, do these layers get separated like that? Layer two, is there a dot, 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 or something between each layer, so it, this thing knows to stop reading? It's a certain offset in the packet. Okay. So if the packet is a big pile of ones and zeros, it knows that you know the destination MAC is 48 bits, the uh, source MAC is another 48 bits, and then there's some amount of preamble, and then after you know 180 packet, 180 bits or so, that's the end of okay. layer two, and then starting from Starting from that next offset in the packet is the destination IP address, which would be 32, <coughs> ones and zeros, and so on. Everything is in binary in the packet. Um, does that make sense? So it knows the length. Yeah, it knows, it knows how long the layer two portion of the packet is exactly. <coughs> All right, so this guy is a router then. So <coughs> this packet comes into this thing. Um, and it needs to know where do I send uh, for a destination of 64.233.177.105 <clears throat> if the uh, switch had this MAC address table in it any idea what how the router might work same way Maintains a table of some sort, right? 
What's in the table? Um, network and next hop. Uh, and this is called a routing table. So in this case, um, in this case, it may have like a um, 130.127.8.0 slash 24, and the next hop is 130.127.3.3. It may have 130.127.9.0 slash 24, 130.127.3.4. And then at the very end, it might have a thing called <coughs> default. As an example. Um, so in the case of, um, is it gonna have an entry in its routing table for 64.233.177.105? No. Probably not. So, What's it going to hit in that table to make a decision? Maybe that's default. You send it okay. on the line. Okay. Now you got to know what my next question coming is. Where did you send the default? Now, I just told you all that information. How did I? <laughs> did, did the router just discern that via the ether or something? How did you discern <coughs> that? Well, you could watch the entire traffic. No, it wouldn't learn anything like that. Um, that's that's one way. Um, I could have just gone on this router and said IP route uh, default 131.273.1 to get, and then I could have said IP route 131.27.9.0 slash 24 next hop 131.27.3.4, um, and that's called a static entry, a static routing table. And as a network engineer, if I really had nothing better to do. I could, for every router on the network, type all this in. And every time somebody moved a network or something happened, I'd say, okay, all right, all right, I'll change the router. And you go and you change the router. But that's probably not a very efficient way to run a network, wouldn't you think? So anybody have any idea how it's done in reality? It's probably, it has an RIP there. Exactly. Okay. Bobby said RIP earlier. Um, and that stands for Routing Information Protocol. And what that is, is a, that was the first routing protocol. And what that does is, it's a protocol. When I say protocol, it just means like, when I talk to you, usually if I walked up to you in the hall, I said, hi, how are you? And you say, I'm fine, how are you? And then I say, hey, listen, would you, that way of doing that is a protocol, right? A protocol is nothing but a standard defined way of how I'm gonna interface with you so a protocol and network is the same thing, a standard way for how I'm going to, in this case, get routing information. So every routing protocol is different, but the gist is the router uh, sends out a broadcast to everywhere and it says, hey, I'm a router and I know how to get to 130.127.8.0. And, you know, and my IP address is this. And they say, oh, cool. And so then they make a little entry in the routing table and add that. <coughs> Um, various other types of routing protocols are OSPF, Open Shortest Pass Perth, First, EIGRP, Enhanced Internetwork Gateway Routing Protocol. This is the one we actually use at Clemson. Uh, <coughs> other ones are ISIS, Intermediate System, the Intermediate System. They all work in various ways. RIP was the first one. I wrote this up here, 131.278.0 slash 24. Anybody know what the slash 24 means? It's how many bits of that first part of code, 14 bits? Yeah, Marty said it, it's the net mask. So we talked earlier and I told you that this was a net mask here. Right, 255.255.255.0. And then I told you that that was an easy one to convert to binary because 255 is all ones. 
and binary. So how many ones are there in this? In the whole network section, there are 24. So slash 24 is just a shorthand. This is the way we do subnet masks today. Instead of saying 255, 255, 2550, I just say slash 24, and that means that there are 24 uh, ones you know, in the net mask. It's a 24-bit <coughs> network. Stop me if this is throwing you off. So this is totally different than IPv6, right? Um, the only difference um, is that uh, Everything is exactly the same except instead of only 32 bits, there's 128. The other difference, it's an excellent question, Bobby. The only other difference is, is that instead of using ARP, they have a different mechanism. But everything else is exactly the same. And that's the cool thing about this is, is that I can just rip out one of these protocols and put a different one in. And what Bobby's referring to and what I'm telling you about today um, is IP version 4, which is what we're all familiar with. Um, IP versions, the, the issue is, is that they, people are taking bets, but somewhere around the end of August, first part of September, there will be no more free IP addresses in the U.S., none. IP version 4 addresses. So you get a new phone or something like that, you provider better have some or you're not getting any. Um, the answer to the problem is the next version of the internet protocol, which is version 6, um, instead of using 32 bits, it uses 128 bits to represent the address. Um, and it's a pretty dire problem because for years everybody's been saying, ah, I don't care about that. IPv4 works, I don't care. I don't care. You know, well, now you're going to start caring because there are any more. We've used them all up. Um, and we have historically thought of an IP address as a pretty scarce commodity. You know, in a typical network on campus, we would allocate 256 addresses to a building. <coughs> typical allocation in IPv6 is 19 billion, I think, in a, in a normal network. So, you know, instead of this scarcity mentality, we should be moving to this you know, sure, you want a couple million addresses to take home to the kids, it doesn't matter to me. You know? um, it's an inconceivably large, but the only reason I use IPv4, frankly, is in, in this demonstration is because it's a whole lot easier to draw and, and talk about. So thank you, Bobby. That's a really good point. So <clears throat> these, um, uh, these routers, they use this routing protocol and they send information around to one another about um, that ultimately winds up populating the routing table that is in each one of these routers here. All right, so now the router knows <coughs> this packet <coughs> left this switch and it went to this router right here and now this packet is sitting here on this router um, and um, it's, its MAC address actually on the interface that it came in on was A right there. <clears throat> that packet has to move on down eventually to some other router based on what it learned in its routing table, right? Does anything, the switch didn't do a thing to that packet, it just moved it on through as it was. What, uh, what happens to it once it starts getting into routers? Does it start rewriting the destination IP address? Destination, does the destination IP change? Um, this is still um, is it a source? 64.233. That's not changing. So what is going to happen? You're, you're, you're on target. Something has to change in that packet. It has to rewrite something in that packet. So I guess where it came from. Or we... Well, the source IP is still 130.127.4.2. Right. Right. Stop. That's not in the packet. Uh, Ari's getting it. Uh, what was it? There you go. What do you say? Uh, destination. Destination back. Destination back. Exactly. There you go. Because now, 
let's say that we learned that the default pointed towards this router right here. We got to move this packet, right? Yeah. So we have to wipe out, let's say this guy's, the MAC address here is E. So we're going to actually rewrite that MAC portion of the packet, and then it's going to, then we're going to drop it on the network. And let's just say, for example, there was a layer two switch in here, and it learned, you know, where these different MAC addresses are, you know, now it's going to get to the right place, you see. So as a packet moves through the network, <clears throat> switches just take their best guess at sending it out in the right direction. If they have an entry in their MAC address table, they'll match that, and if they don't, they'll just flood it out every port, but in any case, it's guaranteed it's going to get there. A router makes an exact decision um, and figures out where it's going, and then based on information that's MAC address table, rewrites the destination MAC address field. That is the difference between a switch and a router is that the router actually rewrites the destination MAC portion of the packet. So as the packet goes bit, 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 bit through the routers, its destination MAC address is getting rewritten until it comes out on the very end over here with the actual MAC address of www.google.com in the packet. But that does not occur until it leaves whatever that is right there. See? Does that make sense? Yeah. So we talked about um, we talked about what was going on in here, and that Clemson uses this routing protocol called the Enhanced Internet Work Gateway Routing Protocol, which is actually a Cisco proprietary one, and we're probably going to have to switch off of. Um, <clears throat> but out here, what are all these clouds that I just drew? It's in general, it's what? Different types of providers. Yeah, in general, what I'm talking about here is, is the internet, right? Yeah. Um, and does anybody know what discrete, what networks are called on the internet? Yeah. yeah. Specifically, <laughs> they are called autonomous systems. Clemson, as in this network right here, is an autonomous system, and its number is 12158. That is Clemson's autonomous system number. Every network that is connected to the internet and has more than one connection has been assigned an autonomous system number. And so the, the reason that <coughs> we do this is because on the internet, they don't want to know, nobody wants to know about whatever sort of complexity I have in my local network. All they want to know is like, oh, to get to google.com, I got to go through AS, you know, this is maybe one, this is two, this is three, four, and five. <clears throat> in order to get to google.com, I would go via, I could go via autonomous system one, three, four to get there, to get to Google. Um, <clears throat> and I don't care what those people are doing in there. All I know is that they are advertising that they can get, they can get me to Google. <clears throat> so what do you think it is that makes this happen out here on the internet? And what do you think might be special about these routers that I've drawn right here as compared to these routers over here? So these protocols, these routing protocols that we talked about are called uh, IGPs, or um, interior gateway protocols. Um, that means they work inside of an autonomous system. <clears throat> what goes on out here is technically an EGP, <clears throat> an exterior gateway protocol. Um, and there is only one example of that today, and it's called BGP, Border Gateway Protocol. Um, and it is a routing, tape, routing protocol, same as what we talked about here. It maintains a network and an next hop. The only difference 
<clears throat> one of the differences is that it also keeps track of autonomous system numbers. Um, the other difference is I told you that the way that the IGPs work is the router says, hey, I'm a router and I know how to get to these networks. And everybody's like, cool, he knows how to router and he knows how to get to all these networks. I'll put that in my table. Whereas out here, this is a default trust model typically. This is a default not trust model because I am not going to trust you to say, you know, they're not going to listen to me and, and hear, have me say, hey, I know how to get to google.com. I could do that. I could configure this router right here to advertise 64.233.177, you know, and if they were dummies, they'd believe me and start sending me all Google's traffic and I'd start reading everybody's email and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. But <clears throat> they're not going to do that. So it's a trust model. So what happens is in this case, Clemson, as I've drawn it, has connected to, do, to two different autonomous systems, which equates to two different ISPs. And then we have paid them money. And in exchange for that money, we have made an agreement with them. We've said, okay, ISP, I'm going to advertise to you um, 130.127.0.0 slash 16. What does the 16 mean? Mass. It, means, it means that this much of the network, that that's what net, that I'm going to advertise to you roughly 64,000 hosts, um, you know, and a network that's like that. And they say, okay, all right, I'll take that advertisement. Um, I believe that I've looked it up. You are Clemson and you are authorized to advertise that network. And in exchange for that, I'm going to send you back every single IP prefix on the internet. Um, and there are today 500,000 prefixes, I think. So this is a, this is a, this is a network prefix. That's one. And so I'm going to say, I'm going to say, Hey, I know how to get to 13127. And they're going to say, well, that's cool. Here's how to get to 500,000 other things on the internet. Um, <clears throat> um, so then in my routing table, I'm going to add 500,000 entries in there. And they're going to add one entry based on what I told them. And if I'm connecting to multiple autonomous systems, I'm going to get multiple routes to the same place. And then these, these routers right here, we call border routers, are going to have to make decisions on, you know, there's multiple ways to get to google.com. And it's going to have to figure out which one is the best way and it's going to send the packet in that direction. Uh, it could, the default way is what is the shortest autonomous system path. Um, there are other ways, like maybe I'm paying a dollar a megabit for that connection and, uh, you know, two dollars a megabit for that connection. Uh, so I might kind of force traffic to go this way unless it only had to go this way. And specifically in Clemson's case, one of these would be a network called Internet 2, which is a, a private network that connects colleges and universities across the U.S. as well as Google and other things. And there is no metering on it. So it's hundreds of megabits of wide open bandwidth. And so every college, so we advertise our prefixes to Internet 2. And, if you, and believe me, if, if we can send you traffic that way, we're going to send it that way because it's cheaper and there's more bandwidth and everything. But if Internet 2 went away and I had to send traffic to colorado.edu via you know, an expensive ISP, then that's what we would do. So, and inside of each one of these autonomous systems, what's going on? Same exact thing. Everything that we just talked about here is the same thing repeated over and over again. So that is the life of a packet. I got my web page. Sweet. <laughs> well, that's, hey, that's all we I'll were doing, <laughs> Marty, all we were doing was getting your request for the web page. <laughs> <laughs> so we got the request. We got the request here. Now we have to get it back. It's just the exact same thing in reverse, all the way back. So now he got that. The request came in here, and the get forward slash HTTP 1.1 got sent to the 
you know, HTTPD daemon running on that thing. And he said, oh, he wants my, my web page. So what does he do? Fills up this portion of the packet with all the HTML that builds that web page and pictures and whatever else. And then starts filling in all the fields. Fills in all the fields and sends it back this way. And exactly the same thing happens back the other way. <clears throat> so those border routers are big and expensive because they have to hold all those routes and they have exactly. to travel and sell and They have to hold really multiple fast. copies of it. So, um, um, you know, we may get um, 30,000 routes from there, we may get 500,000 routes from there, we may connect to some other ISP and get another copy of that 500,000 routes. Um, <clears throat> and so it it actually has multiple tables. It get, has all the routes that it got, and then through whatever metrics I, as a network operator, have set up as how I want it to do that, it picks the best one and actually inserts that into the routing table cool. to figure that out. Um, and kind of the art form is you can easily select, you know, you can easily cause traffic to go out the right way. But influencing your return traffic is like a, is a black art, basically. Uh, and what you don't want is traffic going out this way and then coming back this way, because it's a different path, right? So this this might be a really fast one and this might be a really slow one. So you may be able to send data really fast and receive it very slowly. So does Google take try to look at the packet to see what I don't really have where it came from? Though. So there are various. I can do things to my routing advertisement to make a certain route look more desirable out this way. Um, and there are sites out on the internet called Looking Glasses, which are um, basically routers that ISPs have set up that I can log into with a public username and password and take a look at the routing table as they see it. And then I can manipulate my routing advertisement to, to make it so that they see things in certain ways and so that they would then start sending packets in certain ways. So uh, operating this BGP stuff right here, that's like, that's advanced networking. Um, because if you get it wrong, you can easily wind up black hole in traffic and making it so Clemson is not on the internet anymore. Um, or you can make it so that traffic is going through a really bad path. Or a really expensive path, maybe. So, yeah. So, uh, it used to be that all the, the tables were not secure, and that was an issue because hackers would go in and change it. Has that all been tightened down? Now? Yeah, for the most part, usually when, like this link right here, somebody said it earlier, this is called a peering. And so, when that peering is signed up, number one, a couple of things, a minimum of a couple of things happen. One, I am not going to accept any route advertisements from, before I turn up this link, I'm going to say only accept, well, more likely if this ISP says, hey, can you turn up this link to Clemson, whatever he says, only accept the, the networks that they're authorized to advertise. So that's one thing. So I can't just say um, Google or um, you know, YouTube or whatever. <clears throat> um, that's one thing. The other thing is that now they uh, exchange, can exchange keys before the peering actually comes up. Um, what else? So it, it's a mix of those two things. I think maybe, I'm guessing maybe half of the, half of the peerings out there are actually using signed keys <coughs> and stuff like that for certificates before they come up. But, um, but pretty much just setting up route filters so that so I don't care what he says, I'm only accepting 131.27. Um, what else? I'm gonna have to ask two questions for that. Okay. One. So um, how do VPNs fit in? Um, they don't really. Um, a VPN just, so what does a VPN do but, but basically cover the whole thing up? So. If I um, have a VPN client on my computer and then somewhere out here I have a VPN concentrator. So
So then I set up a secure, um, I set up a connect to this VPN concentrator right here. And then, <clears throat> let's see, I think a, a better example would be if I was out here somewhere on the internet and I connected to this, all it does is it creates an encrypted tunnel across whatever all the way to here. So, you know. And by that, you yeah. just by using that. Right? And what it does, what it actually does, is it takes this whole packet right here, the whole thing, and wraps it up in, this is now the data portion of the packet, sticks it into that, um, another packet, and then it gets to the VPN concentrator, whose once it, once it gets there, it strips all that off and dumps that packet out on the network. That's, that's what it does is it's encapsulating the packet. And it, it, it encrypts that, right? Correct, yeah. Yeah, all that, that packet, that whole thing is nothing but a bunch of ones and zeros, so it just encrypts it and then decrypts it and then dumps the packet back out on the network where it came from. So decrypts it. my computer out here, you know, has an IP address of so if I was hanging out over at Google, it would be 64.237.177.something. Um, and so, but then I fire up my VPN client, um, and now my VPN client, I connect to this concentrator. And so my computer is actually um, <coughs> building the packets as if it had a 130.127, but all those packets are getting wrapped in 64.237.177. And it's doing all that. It's transporting this pile of encrypted data across the internet. It's decrypting it over here and then dumping that 130, 127 packet out over here. And then it's releasing it out of the network and it's flowing. Does that make sense? I'm glossing over a couple of details. But. So, so if I was like at a hotel at a conference yep. and I wanted, I wanted to do some of my own banking. Right. So if I do a VPN connection to Clemson, right. I want to get me within Clemson securely. Network, securely. Right. And then I could then it takes me out to my bank. As long as you trust everything that happens from here on out to your bank. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so you could have hackers that we, would be creating for us. So well they probably take the encryption out here too. Yeah, I mean they could intercept that and but they'd have to decrypt each packet. You know, and we assemble the fleet and yeah, and it's happening in real time. And, so. and, and the packets seem as though they're coming from Clemson, right? Uh, well, out here, they're, they're coming from Google's network, you know, and but they're headed towards Clemson. Once they get here, then that, this is unpacked and the Clemson packet is now taken and dumped onto the network and then it goes if you were going to BBNT or something like that, and BBNT was here, <clears throat> so so you fired up a VPN client from you're sitting hanging out over at Google. You fired up a VPN client back to Clemson, and you're going to your bank's webpage, bbnt.com. Um, <clears throat> so your computer is sending out packets addressed to the VPN concentrator at Clemson. Those packets get to the VPN concentrator at Clemson. It decrypts that. It takes this packet, which has got the um, destination of bbnt.com in it, and it dumps it out on our network, and it says, oh, bbnt.com matches the default next hop, sends it out, out to the internet and back here. Follow me. So the only advantage of doing that from the standpoint of security is that because it's routing back from Clemson, there's a big hose coming out on the internet. Right. Well, you're assuming if you're in a hotel or something like that, that there could be a bad person sitting in the hotel equipment room that's actually sniffing your traffic. Um, and in this case, they can't, A, because it's, it's they could look at your packet and, it, and they would see that it's destined to the IP address of the VPN concentrator at Clemson. And then after that was a big pile of encrypted data and it wouldn't do them any good. Presumably there isn't a bad person sitting in one of our closets sniffing traffic. So. 
you can laugh, but um, no, other people, uh, you know, Google was pretty furious when they found out that some government agency had actually dug up the fiber out there and was looking at all the traffic. It really does happen. The one thing that would bother me with VPN, I know Ms. Burnett, you're in, but you have to type in your username and password and then connect to the VPN. Right. So is your password vulnerable um, before you connect to that VPN or somebody might get mad and check it? I don't really know enough to answer that question too intelligently, but that is all encrypted as part of what goes across to the VPN concentrator. Well, I had asked and they said no, that that's encrypted. Oh, yeah. That, that, that yeah. transmission is encrypted. That yeah. Yeah. Right. I was going to say the same thing. Yeah, the, the, client, the client, the client has certain encryption okay. that sends it. And there's a public and private key between the client and the okay. yeah the VPN. Okay. Right. So, so I only had one little question, which on for IPv6, that shorthand notation is that's trans. I guess that's translated to the full number of bits before it ever gets stuffed into a packet, for. That how you, you know how you can shorten IPv6 addresses down to something pretty tight? Right. So there's a set of rules. So an IPv6 pack. So we represent IPv4 using dotted decimal, with each decimal being up to 255, right? Um, if you did that with IPv6, and I have a separate presentation on IPv6, maybe we can do another time. Um, if you if you use that dotted decimal notation, the IPv6 address would like take up the whole board. So we use hexadecimal to uh, represent an IPv6 address. And then there's a set of rules. So the good thing about IPv6 is although it's a great big long address, um, guess what most of those digits are in that great big long address? They're zeros. So you don't need to, you know, there's a shorthand notation for, you know, you know, if if you only need to represent 64,000 hosts, then you might as well make them all zeros and make your address be pretty small. And the only difference, um, so let's say that, uh, you know, remember in the very early part of our discussion, uh, we talked about we had www.google.com and we used DNS to convert it into this IP address. With IPv6, all that happens is if I happen to send uh, you know, an IPv6 DNS request, meaning I could accept what's, so this, this came back as an A record, a DNS A record. A quad A record is the IPv6 answer. So www.google.com has this IPv4 address, it also has an IPv6 address. The only difference is that instead of getting back this V4 address, I got a V6 address, um, and then I would put the destination IPv6 address in the same field. So, I really should do one of these talks with IPv6 as well. But, um, but it's, it's really no different. It comes shorter address, it's all, and ARP is different, it's called neighbor discovery in IPv6. Is there a line of equipment that I have to change for six? No, fortunately, everything we have uh, still supports it. Now, does, does, does this guy care about IPv6? Nope. Has no clue what IP is. These guys do, but IPv6, the protocol was was finalized in 1998. So this is something that routing equipment has been, you know, back in the late 90s, everybody thought this would be a big problem. Um, and <clears throat> the answer to the problem at the time was we got SNAP. Well, NAT was one thing, network address translation, uh, and then the other thing was um, we started, it used to be that one of the things that the um, routing protocol has in it is the net mask. So we used to say, you've heard of class A networks, class B networks, class C networks. It used to be that the first number of bits in an IP address would tell you whether it was a class A, B, or C network, and that would tell you that the subnet mask was either a slash 24, a slash 16, or a slash 8. Well, and then and then the whole reason we did that was because RIP didn't send any information about the uh, the net mask with each network. So it just said, well, why should we do that if we just say that the first, you know, the first few bits tell you the answer to that? Well, 
The problem was that wastes great volumes of addresses. And they had no idea. The first internet that they hooked together had eight hosts on it. And, and making one that had, you know, six billion addresses on it seemed like a gross excess. And why would a computer network ever need that many addresses? They had no concept that one day everybody would have three or four IP addresses in their pocket. Um, who, who was this? His, he can't imagine anyone needing even personal computer. Right. No, I forget who that was. Yeah. Bill Gates. People all the time, you know, when, when I tell them, oh, well, in IPv6, we assign a slash 64 to a building. Oh, that's wasteful. That's wasteful. It's just like they said we'd never need more than 128K RAM. You know? No, no, no. You don't understand the scale of things. I think you could assign so many million addresses every second and it would take you 500 million years to assign every it's on that scale before you ran out of addresses so god knows what we're getting into but the whole internet of things is is a real deal in the watt building over here the uh, lights in there are power over ethernet lights um, and every light bulb has an ipv6 address um, so um, the reason they do that is so that they can make it be whatever color you want or whatever and so you can program it to light however you, you would like so you have thousands of little LEDs and every single one of them with an IPv6 address and that's what lights the room Wow so, um, and it all works like this I didn't realize we had enough pay usage I always thought well well, it is wide open. It's just that, uh, like, um, the connection to, uh, you know, CenturyLink or something, we pay, um, uh, we, we, we have a 10 gig link and we pay so many dollars a megabit for that 10 gig link. It's already paid for. So it's up, we use it. Versus, you know, we pay, Maybe we pay twenty thousand dollars a month for this one versus the Internet Two connection is a seventy-seven thousand dollar a year uh, membership fee with nothing else, and like in a hundred gigs of uh, bandwidth for that is an example. Yeah, I mean, so I had a county and I put it on the cable modem, and I don't I got to read the fine detail, and they had a usage cap. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, bad. Yeah, I didn't, didn't like that's that. when we bought that new too. <laughs> but anyways, thanks y'all, and, and if you want to talk more about it, I'll stick around for a while. So. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.